for the balance of the time until 3.30, the next hour, uh, until we do a close, uh, we're just going to uh, pursue uh, some of the questions that have uh, arisen here. Um, the first person I want to call on is Angela O. Oh. Angela is a member of the Commonweal Board of Directors. Uh, she uh, is the co-director of the Gift of Compassion project at Commonweal. Um, and um, she is nationally known for her work in um, uh, justice-related work going back decades. Uh, she's a mediator for the state of California in fair housing and fair employment. Um, and um, really um, one of the most um, thoughtful people I know about this, um, uh, this catastrophe that we're facing. And we've been having several phone calls over the last couple of weeks and this was the question that I posed to her specifically, but I've asked her to just say whatever she'd like to say, but I'll, I'll put out the question. Um, she's been doing extraordinary work down by the border uh, with uh, undocumented uh, immigrants. And as she says, a group of people that she's involved with who uh, talk about the border, uh, a situation of hell and heaven, that it's hell on one side of the border, and for them, heaven on the other. And she's been working with an extraordinary friend of ours who's been walking, actually starting with a fall gathering here at one point. He had the conception of walking down to the border, which you've been very involved with and I hope you'll speak to. But I, I said to Angela, here's the situation of many, many situations that we face. We have hundreds of thousands of people now who are fleeing desperate situations in, uh, in Latin America and Central America. We have hundreds of thousands in Africa and the Middle East who are facing these situations. They are fleeing to the north. And all around the world, walls are going up. As climate change extends, as it becomes completely unlivable, around the equatorial areas, as the phenomena of failed states and criminal gangs everywhere increases, those hundreds of thousands of people are likely to become millions of people. They will flood toward habitable areas of the world. And the question is, what will happen? Will the walls continue to get bigger and stronger? What about the peoples who were not necessarily right-wing fascists, but just had some idea of what their country and their tribe meant to them, who faced, like in Italy and Greece and other places, faced with enormous numbers of migrants that they don't feel they can absorb? I would submit to you that progressives have no answers to this. Conservatives, uh, not conservatives, but uh, uh, nationalists have answers, which are walls. So the question for someone who has a compassionate vision is what do we do? And not only what do we do, what do we think? So as I spoke to Angela, she said to me, and it felt so memorable, that she didn't have the answer, but that she felt we needed to find our way into a place that we could not yet imagine yet. That was basically what you said. And for me, that made perfect sense, because when I think about my response to the, pro the, the civilizational process, I think of Commonweal, in many respects, as a fleet of ambulances that go out into the war zones of the world and take care of the wounded wherever we find them, whatever side they were on. I can say that in the Cancer Health Program and Healing Circles, we exclude politics because we're just dealing with the wounded, you know? And so for me, I can at once sense that our mission is to take care of the wounded and to take care of the suffering and to recognize that as progressives, we really have no answer to this migrational reality. My own vision, such as it is, is that we could imagine 
eco-villages and eco-cities being set up in northern United States, Canada, and Alaska, and that we would save as many people as we possibly could by encouraging migrations into a new ecological civilization. That's an imagining. But I, I just submit to you that part of our problem, speaking of some of us at least as progressives, is that we don't face the fact that our solutions, when we talk about a humane immigration system and you know, a path to citizenship for dreamers and so on and so forth, we don't face the reality that that may work for hundreds of thousands, but it's going to have a very hard time working for millions. And unless we have these dialogues about the reality that Nate has described and that we're going to be facing in different ways, uh, then we leave these vast swaths of these issues to people who really do not have humanity on their side. So that's just an introduction to whatever you'd like to say. And uh, I, I, asked, I asked Angela to speak for 10 minutes, and then we're going to have more conversation. Can you speak there? Um, and so I also was born and raised in L.A., at a point in time when in 1992 it made a difference that I had a voice and was finished with former edu formal education and was oriented toward um, civil rights, feminism, um, free speech, the justice movement, because I was on the tail end of that whole transformation in our society. So my lens was very different from the majority of the population that looked like me in LA in 92. And that is why when uh, I was on Ted Koppel's show, I could put together um, an analysis that took into consideration the economic downturn. We were in a recession. The role of the media that hyped this tension that did exist between blacks and ethnic Koreans because of the space we occupied in LA at the time. And the shooting of a young African-American girl named Natasha Harlins by a Korean Store, store owner named Sun Jadu. I also um, was part of the police misconduct referral service uh, discussions where we talked about the corruption in the LAPD under Daryl Gates and the regular beatings and assaults of men of color on the streets of LA. So when we saw the beating of Mr. King, it was not a surprise. We sat in our first meeting and said, well, great. Now everyone can see what goes on and what kind of cases we're handling and what it looks like for real on the streets. Um, and so here I am, fast forward today, and I decided, you know, I had many conversations with lawyers who hated what they did. I think I'm the only lawyer I know who, as long as I'm doing my work, I love it more and more and more. I love what I do um, as that part of my life, but I also teach meditation. I was fortunate to have the ability to leave my law job for about six years, somewhat itinerant. and. Um, really got to uh, a place where I could reflect, be quiet, not use the thing that lawyers are trained to do, just be silent. And amazing things surfaced in that practice. I was fortunate to meet a teacher. Our teaching is that the true human body is the entire universe. 20 some years ago, that phrase came to me. The true human body is the entire universe. So in understanding that, um, I had to undo a lot of my, quote, education. My teacher used to say, people with more degrees are more difficult to train spiritually <coughs> because they always think there's an answer, number one, and they always have an answer, they think. So we're in one of those situations where the answers are um, innumerable as innumerable as the number of people probably walking the face of this earth. Because everybody needs to make their own decision. We talk about fearlessness. I hear this a lot in these trainings that I, I am invited to. People use that word very freely. But right now is a time when if you have that quality, you need to step up. You really need to step up. Because um, it's not a matter of just you know being nervous about a situation. We're talking about a friend who is on a pilgrimage right now who left Wichin, East Oakland. And he left on March 12th. It was significant because this is the day that Gandhi started his great salt march. And he follows the principles of Gandhi. 
He left home with no food, no water, no sleeping bag, no currency, no intoxicants, no, <laughs> just a couple pairs of pants, good walking shoes, a couple socks, and a big flag of the ultimate, what he calls selfie, the earth. I walked with him for two days out of, I think he was on day 74 when he finally got to LA. I, I communicate with him every morning and every night. You, you, some of you know him. This is Pancho Francisco Ramos Stierle. And he used to be a Casa de Paz in Oakland. Um, he is today somewhere near Encinitas, 35 miles north of the border. In the meantime, I am talking to the ground team come up from Mexico. And they've been doing some intelligence gathering and planning for an assembly that will take place on June 15th. We will walk across the border. Pancho, who is undocumented, may walk across the border. He hasn't decided yet. He's meditating on this as he walks. It, it certainly means that he will likely not come back. If that, if that walk happens, and he'll do his work wherever, as he says, wherever I am on the planet, I will continue to do this work. I will plant trees, I will engage people, and in the days that I was with him, um, I only walked for two days and I had really bad blisters, so, so bad that my spouse had to carry me on his back from the living room of a friend to the car parked at the, <laughs> at the curb, because uh, you have to train for this kind of walk. So, um, you know, I witnessed the most amazing things on the street. I'm going to just share a few things because, yeah, the world is collapsing. You've got plenty of data to prove that point. And if you need any particular slice of it, economic, political, social, spiritual, um, you know, you can find the study. You can find the data. But uh, where are the evidence of humanity? I saw it, you know, and it... In fact, I had a young undocumented Korean gal walking with us who has been up here at Common Will um, in, in the Power of Hope uh, camp. And she and a, a young man from Iran who just became a, a citizen walked with us for a half of an evening. And she said, you know, her job is to organize, by the way, uh, um, undocumented students. And she's been really down, and it was part of the reason she, why she was walking with us is she wanted to feel like, you know, is there anything out there that can give us hope? The, the Congress isn't going to move. We're working our asses off. You know, there are fights between organizations that are trying to do supposedly the same thing, a common goal. And these fissures, of course, are what has been discovered at the border by the ground team come up from Mexico. So we're not asking organizations to come forward. We're all reaching out to our individual friends and networks to say there's an assembly going to happen on June 15th. We're going to start at the San Ysidro Park and we will walk across the border to the IMAX dome. And the thing that wants to emerge that we all feel very strongly wants to emerge, but none of us know what that thing is, will be co-created, truly co-created. Nobody's got an agenda. I will say that many of the people that are involved you may know Nipun Mehta, you may know, um, you may know Sonia De Otto, you may know um, De Janeira, Invest in Youth down in the south, you may know the Groundswell Foundation. These are all um, entities whose staff or support people or members are going to show up. Alice said to me, I've been so down and just walking with you guys for the last two hours has renewed my spirit. I feel so happy to know that you're out here doing this, right? So here's what I am telling you this story. I don't know about all the stuff that Michael talked about. I mean, that's a whole series of conversations we should probably have at some point. But my spouse, his name is Tutu, is an artist. And he said to me, when you go up there, if you talk, could you tell them to get out of their Western frame of thinking? Could you tell them that, you know, there are things happening in the East? And remember, there are two cultures that, according to at least one study that's looked at 3,000 years and hundreds of cultures that have, civilizations that have come and collapsed, that two have survived, Chinese culture and Egyptian culture. Okay, these, these civilizations have survived. You may not like the politics of what you see, 
but there's something deep about the teachings. And for him anyway, because he's totally bicultural and bilingual, he reads the New York Times and he reads the Guardian and he reads the Intercept and he reads all of the news in language in China. You got a billion point four people there. That is a tough society to navigate. And they are doing some pretty innovative things. So we don't get to hear about it here because all we hear about is the, the New York Times analysis, which speaks to the intelligentsia to, to make you know, China look like it's a horrible society. But when you got 1.4 billion people, you're gonna have some struggle. Not saying it's right, but you know, we've gotta give each other some girth and really sincerely look for where the opportunities are for bridging, building bridges building bridges, even from here to here, as Pancha says, this is the hardest bridge to build. This to this a little bit easier, but the bridge that has to be built from here to here, a lot of work, a lot of work. So we do things like meditation, we find people who are generous enough to give some of their insight from what they've learned. So um, what I wanted to say was, uh, I want to share Pancho's writing from this morning. He gets up at like five and starts walking, sometimes 22 miles in a day. I don't have answers, you know, and I don't feel bad about that <laughs> because we don't know what that is yet. But here's what he sent to me this morning at 5.30. Belly and Angelita, here are some lines that emerged this morning. To the, today, the clouds and ocean are indistinguishable. The horizon vanished with the incessant rhythm of this breathing, feel synchronized with the larger lungs of Mother Earth. And even with the galactic integrated dance, the condensation of the clouds of the cosmos into the nectar of life. Young, if you don't know, he's an astrobiologist by training. The shore smiles as each, as each weave recedes leaving planetary dimples and wrinkles hosted in the heart of anyone aware of them, an ubiquitous, humble, and simple joy. Today, the stillness of the clouds, the motion of the ocean, and the happy condensed human wave are one. Today, there is no horizon, no future, no destination, just now. Only wrinkles and dimples of a smiling beach the ocean floor, a mating dance for the human continent in an infinite coast lost in the distance as a stairway back to the stellar heaven, all in an instant. Today, the choreography and music of water in all her forms and ripples of life, this wet fire, this liquid star are one and the same. Today, the heart mind of the earth is a loud, joyous smile with sore and happy planetary cheeks, a hysterical laughter of undivided love. So that's where I'm gonna end and happy to take questions later. Thank you so much, Angela. Angela, I'm, I'm so moved by what you said uh, uh, and also by what Joanna said and what you both did in different ways was to take us out of the larger questions and down into our humanity and, and, you know, and not having answers, uh, but being awake and alive to the present day and, and what we can do, uh, what we can experience. So, um, so um, I'd, I'd like to just uh, do a quick round, starting with Joan and asking each of you as you've heard experience the morning, um, what are any brief reflections that you have? And not surprisingly, there have been many, many areas that have triggered thoughts and, more importantly, questions. Some of the issues that have surfaced that seem particularly close to home are the issues of the intergenerational tension, which I think is fundamental to moving forward as we face some form of collapse, and also our own dissonance when dealing with collapse. And I'd like, this isn't exactly your question, Michael, but I think it's something I'd like to say, that I believe that all of the initiatives that are reflected in this room and in the broader community that deal with our deep problems and issues, manifestations of collapse, 
are phenomenal initiatives, and they're all preparing us to be equipped to deal with some sort of shock, whether it's financial or whether it's, you know, a climate change of 1.5 to 2 degrees, which are serious issues, and we want to be able to respond to those with some sort of resilience and grace. However, I also realize, and it came back to me today listening, that primarily because we didn't touch on this, that I believe that in order to stop climate change at two degrees, which is a serious issue, it'll require a very bold rebellion. It'll require more than the sort of initiatives that we're talking about because we're going to require our governments, our leaders, and every institution to respond with a courage and in ways that are contrary to how we've behaved in the past. And I don't have an answer to that, but that's what is hanging close to my heart and head as I pass the mic. I have so many thoughts in my head. Uh, everything is so resonant, and um, I, I, I'm thinking that when I hear us all say, when we face collapse, you know, I mean, it's, it takes your breath away, you know, to, you know, as I see culture disintegrate and the world die, you know, I mean, it's a very deep, dark place to go. And yet we're trying to change consciousness so that people feel that their larger body is the earth and that the earth is just as important and as essential to themselves and everyone, right, as their own life and their children's life. So how do we do it? I don't think we do it by saying, you know, are you ready for the collapse? Because it sounds like a kind of cult or something. Like it sounds like the doomsday thing, you know, or, you know, the world is ending, let's drink the Kool-Aid. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't want to have that kind of feeling about it, right? So I think we need, even though we acknowledge in a deep inner sense that it is there. I'm not trying to whitewash it or pretend it isn't or anything like that. But how do we get that kind of, you used a word with hope, I can't think what it was, but that kind of, that the thing that, that has that fire going. Choice. Choice. Intention. Intention, joyful choice, and then imagining of what might be possible and participating in it. So I think we have to be very conscious of that so that we don't have those, I don't have those words yet. I don't even know really what to say yet. But it reminded me, um, I was talking on the, on, on the walk with someone about um, when my children were very young, uh, you know, my, my two-year-old went from the time he was two, loved dinosaurs, right? I mean, a lot of children love dinosaurs. And we invented this holiday together when they were very, very young <laughs> called Dinosaur Equinox that took place at the Winter Equinox on the 21st of December. And it was, so as we thought, you know, it's before Christmas time, you know, it's like end of the year, but it's, and, and it was, a, they, the kids together kind of made this up, but it's so relevant to this thing. It's like, so the, the thing goes like, it's a ritual that has to do with going through the end of the year and the end of the dinosaurs. So the poem, and I only remember the first verse at this moment, was something like, land of volcanoes, land of rocks, <laughs> dinosaur equinox. <laughs> we wish that you were here with us, Parasaurolophilus. <laughs> Parasaurolophilox, dinosaur equinox. <laughs> and it went on. I mean, it was like, it was a, it was a thing. And so the kids would, like, they'd get up there at the dinner and they would, you know, you'd raise your glass and you'd toast to the dinosaurs and honor their spirit. And the kids would say what they loved about the dinosaurs. And then they'd go outside into the snow. We were in Colorado. And they wanted to build a snow dinosaur, but they couldn't figure out how to do that. So they got sticks that were special sticks for this occasion. And they would draw a picture of the dinosaur in the snow and then get little votive candles. And they light those candles and they put them around this drawing of the dinosaur. And I got to tell you, it made you get goosebumps to look at this thing. It was like this, it was like a cave painting or something it looked like. <laughs> and they would then come back to the table 
and there were three courses. This was all very ritualized. And the first one was a, um, an herbivore course. <laughs> and then the second one was the carnivore course. <laughs> and the third was the omnivore course. <laughs> and then there was a cake, or I can't remember what, it, it was a special thing that they, they made, but, but it was like a real thing, is what I'm saying. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe it's time for that kind of thing for us to think what is really sacred, what is really important in the long story of humanity? And how do we tell that in a way that everybody just feels like, oh yeah, I, I love that holiday, you know? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. But I, but I have a feeling that we need to think out of the box. And the other thing is the migration thing, I think is so profound. And I went through a period of real, grief over it when, you know, the, even before that poor little baby was, you know, lying on the beach. And, you know, it was like, you just say to yourself, how can people not care, right? And, and when, Joanna, when you were saying about a broken heart can hold anything, it's as big as you want, it's like, why is it that our hearts aren't big enough to care about the people who are in real danger, right? And, you know, someone will send a little money, but nobody wants to, like, change their life. So I'm thinking it's the same kind of problem as the homelessness problem in L.A. or San Francisco or wherever. How can we walk over people in the street? You know, it's, like, really wrong. And I'm thinking maybe we need to use our creativity to say, okay, uh, like a competition or a something for how can we build housing? How can we house so many people in such a time frame. You, do, do you know what I mean? Not, not how can we go to the moon again. I, it's, it's like, how can we do this and have the responsibility of every community to be to solve that problem in some way and to be proud of it and hold it up there and celebrate the solutions. And then that can spill over for the refugees because where there is extra housing, then people can be welcome. I... Um, I was I came here hoping that I would learn from you, and I have already. And I, I was hoping, naively, that perhaps some of my experience in a very small problem over the last three decades could have some relevance to what we're all talking about. And I'm, I just start feeling from several things that Michael said and Nate said that what we're facing is is just a fundamentally different type of problem and that what the solutions I re relied on, one of the inspirations in my work has been this book by uh, Everett Rogers called um, Diffusion of Innovation. I don't know if, one time I mentioned this to a sociologist and said, have you heard of that book? And he said, you mean the Bible of sociology? <laughs> um, but he, he, this man did a PhD in trying to understand how drought-resistant um, corn in Nebraska spread the, the information about that innovation, spread from the university to farmers. And he felt he detected a certain um, characteristics of how that innovation spread. And he boiled it down to five key things. And then he spent the rest of his life testing whether those characteristics explained how innovation spread of totally different types in totally different uh, civilizations, cultures, and communities around the world. And he modified them slightly over the years, but he found several basic characteristics. And I, it felt like, a, of course, an epiphany to me when I read that, because I felt he was explaining what I had been painfully uh, discovering worked and didn't work in my work. And I, I, I feel, however, especially listening to Nate, that what we are dealing with now we, is beyond any kind of innovation that we have, are, are called upon to discover. And... Um, the the um, how do we answer the question that Michael just asked? 
uh, I really don't know. I can, um, I can say what worked in my little world, and I will explain that some other time and place. But um, I, think, I think at least understanding the magnitude and the difference of what we are now trying to face is, uh, anyway, it's helpful to me. And uh, I thought, by the way, the exercise that uh, we, we did of trying to ex understand what, do, do, what makes us grateful thinking about the, the uh, end of our culture and what makes us sad was so profound. I, uh, especially what my partner said, and I, I appreciate that. And I think maybe this kind of thinking was going to help me go ahead. I have a million thoughts going through my mind, and my narrative has changed so many times, but it's, it, it dawned on me as I'm sitting here, it's like, Two core parts of our work at Commonweal, one is the end of life and the other is the end of the planet. Mm -hmm. Right, so one of our core programs here is the Cancer Health Program. You know, the Cancer Health Program is a week where people with cancer and sometimes the people that care for them and love come with the question when one of the outcomes is you're staring death in the face. And we, we talk about that. What does that mean to stare death in the face? And when we have these conversations here, we also say, what does it mean to stare global collapse or end of the planet? What does it mean to stare it in the face? What do you have to do? What is the kind of readiness that you need? In the Cancer Health Program, it's a, it's a personal transformation. You talk about allopathic mainstream medicine. You talk about complementary medicine. You talk about alternative medicine. You talk about preparing yourself to die sometimes. Or... How are you going to live with this in you? And there's a lot of people here who know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And it's not a coincidence that both these conversations are happening in the same space. Mm -hmm. And it's also interesting that so many people that come through the Cancer Health Program learn about all these different ways and how to deal with this, and then nothing changes. I remember writing a grant once for Google, and they're asking, what is the impact of the Cancer Hope Program? How much behavior change there is? <laughs> and I was, I was new, so I said to Michael, what should we put down, 50%? <laughs> he said 10, right? So, so you have a cancer diagnosis that is going to potentially kill you or change how you live, and yet behavior change doesn't happen. You have all the information. It's not mysterious, and still behavior change doesn't happen. You know that if you exercise, if you eat better, if you meditate, if you relax, if you have support, you will live longer and still behavior doesn't change. And then we hear kind of the, the presentation that Nate shared and we have those same kind of information. So what does it lead? What is it the readiness that, that we need to have as individual or as a society or as a culture in order to create that kind of even more significant change? In some ways, I think it's a lot harder to change your energy consumption than it is to change your diet. <laughs> and, and I don't have the answer to it, but there are some things that come to mind. And the idea of, uh, of what is the emotional, spiritual readiness that needs to happen. We were talking about art over the break. And there's something in that space of the intangible, of the place between science and the non-scientific, that makes our experiences more tangible. There's something there that happens at this fall gathering that Angela mentioned. It's a gathering that's based on creativity. And a bunch of you were here at the last one. When our theme was global collapse, which was in the context of a creative community. So there was theater, there was dance, and Pete Myers was giving the science of where the environment is headed. All in the same space. And I think that's one of the answers. I think there's something about places like Commonweal these retreat centers, these spaces that are kind of monasteries that allow that experience. I do have in my mind kind of what Joan was saying, is that all these small initiatives, they're actually not enough. And I, I think that's true, because the kind of shift that needs to happen is that a scaling up that no nonprofit that I know has the, the methodology or the idea of how to do. It's beyond the scope of what we can think. 
but within the scope of what we can think. Maybe these chains of monasteries, which did lead to Christianity, which had kind of a successful scaling up, um, <laughs> there might be something there at that intersection. Wow. Oh. <laughs> well, I think you're right. And I think what we need is a ritual <laughs> with, with dinosaurs. I think... There's something happening in my head right now because we are facing the collapse of the Holocene, of the last big, you know, since all of life that sprouted up and was so gorgeous and all those mammals like us were since the dinosaurs, beautiful and powerful, though they had a brain the size of a pea. But they, <laughs> <laughs> we had just... I am just so ecstatic thinking about what I'm going to do, <laughs> maybe with you. I'd love to do something with you. Yes. I'm going to get this calendar on the, on the this holiday on the calendar. <laughs> oh, and see that we well, do we want it, and then it could all go into the play because we're so creative in play, and we can break so many uh, mental taboos and personal defenses that we need to let go of when we start. Um, being dinosaurs going extinct ways that we'll be get some smarts about this. So I'm very excited about the um, yeah the people pouring over the border or trying to. Uh, I and thank you for sharing about Pancho's. I feel we have a karma that we've got to face. I just at some point. It was our policies, you know that, in uh, Central America that have made along with climate change, but we ripped the rug out from under uh, their capacity to adjust so much and what, uh, and with the coups that we engendered and... You say nothing of the drug economy. And yeah, the, the uh, our karma there and that we're, we're will be worse for us because we are uh, doing what's almost worse than the goose, that we're blaming them for what we caused. And um, I think that this is deeply needed and it will have to involve a big spiritual frame that will have to, uh, to toward understanding within a frame of self-forgiveness, I think, for, uh, and the same, with the refugees pouring out of uh, the Middle East, what we have been using as our private turf for the oil and what the whole policy there, uh, going back to uh, 2001, no, into 1990, 91, going back before that with the Arabian, yeah, way before that. And uh, maybe, and I think that art will help us with that. I think too, we can open to what's uh, both painful and redemptive uh, by uh, ritualizing and by art and by horsing around as dinosaurs. <laughs> so you, you want me to synthesize all this in a haiku or something, in a pr profound way? <laughs> um, I didn't really... <laughs> it's very interesting to me because... Um, one of the things that Commonweal does to help pay the bills and otherwise is we host, we rent the facilities here for retreats uh, for all kinds of people and organizations. And by coincidence or otherwise, the group that's here right now out there in Pacific House is a, a dear friend of mine's fellows program. It's called the Milago. You might have seen the sign. They are young people from all around the world who are chosen, they have chosen to work in health and conservation and try to improve the world in the poorest part of wherever they're from. And they're all in their 20s and 30s, very rigorous. I tried to, I had dinner with them last night, I tried to change their schedule to get them over here to at least hear some of this, but couldn't do it. They're very, it's very rigorous and so forth. But the interesting narrative or the counter narrative to what Nate talks about, for example, is that in much of the world right now, life is improving very much. So if you go around and you look at things like death rates and hunger and income and all of that, it's coming up. 
in the poorest of the poor, the people being lifted out of poverty by current trends. And it's a wonderful thing. It's not, as, as was mentioned here in some ways, it's not kosher or whatever to bring up the fact that is this sustainable? So why I think a presentation like Nate's is so important because he knows the financial, the economics, et cetera, et cetera, based in the biology, the science. Because as I think I kind of mentioned in introducing Joanna, I was brought or came up in the 70s in an apocalyptic mindset from reading things like Paul Ehrlich and my undergraduate advisor was Garrett Hardin, a famous biologist who talked about immigration becoming the biggest pro or one of the biggest problems in the future. This was all before the climate apocalypse was even really known yet. So living with that contradiction, and I asked some of these young people, why do you do what you do? How did you come to this? And generally get a blank response. What else would I do? You know, So there is some hope there, and I, I'm hoping maybe in the time we can ask Nate again, because when we had him talk before, when we talked before, over in the East Bay in a smaller gathering, he had some lessons or some, some kernels of wisdom from teaching. He's taught a lot more students than I think most of us had in this. But that's the counter narrative that you'll hear, you'll see in the Wall Street Journal, which is fueled by let's keep everything as it is and burn everything up, but also in progressive circles too, you know. I mean, it comes up. Um, so it's been a real struggle for me to, to live with this and, I, and the other dynamic is I spent much of my life helping uh, care for dying people and so forth. You really get that grip, that, that dose of reality of what's important and it's uh, keeping some sense of optimism, of resilience is, is crucial. And so, in, I mean, and the last thing is in close, in uh, the, towards the end of the great, greatest, some people have judged, trilogy, The Lord of the Rings by Tolkien. I was one of the Tolkien geeks when I was a kid and read it over and over. And I think you might, you know, my little story, but the, the, the hobbit who saved the world was named Frodo Baggins. And his guiding light was the good wizard Gandalf. And towards the end, after they have been through this horrendous experience of saving the world from the orcs and the evil Sauron, etc., Frodo is reflecting and he says, I sure wish we didn't have to live through this. And Gandalf says, I wish we didn't have to as well, but we do what we are, we, we work with what we are given and everything depends on how we do it. Thank you all for those first reflections. Angela, uh, any, any thoughts stimulated by all of this? I really think that um, what I said earlier, you know, you have to uh, assess what you're cap capable of doing. Yeah. You know, people don't need to leave their fields of work. People don't need to, but they do have to check in in terms of... Um, realizing what their capacity is. So when, whenever, I've had many years of you know, public speaking and, and inevitably, especially in younger crowds, I wanna do what you do, I wanna be what you are. It's, and I find myself saying, no, you cannot be who I am. You have to be who you are. And you cannot do what I did because the context is gonna change. Even what Nate had to share, which I don't know what it was because I wasn't here, but, but whatever the information was, the context also will change because it's not gonna just be the straight analysis of the information that he has been able to glean from now. Unexpected things will occur, whether that is war, whether that is a natural disaster, whether that is, you know, we were talking about this at lunch. Things change and we're not in as much control as we think, right? We can do our best. And the other thing is, you know, my teacher said, look, go through life and trust everybody 100%. For the person who tells you the truth and is sincere, trust that they're being truthful and sincere. For the person who lies to you every time, trust 100% that they're gonna lie to you every time. <laughs> For the person who tells you half the time the truth and half the time not the truth, trust 100% that half the time you're hearing the truth and half the time you are not. And the other piece he always said was, you know, Angela, learn to expect but don't expect, right? That's what we call the middle way. It's not in the center of a line that's finite. And the balance is not always standing up straight. 
When you're going uphill, you have to lean in. Right now, we're on a collective uphill. We have to lean in. How far you can lean in, how far you wish to lean in, how far your body can take you, let alone your spirit and your soul, it, it depends on you. So there's nobody going to give you the answer. You really have to be still, is my belief. Anytime anybody has a problem, I say, go meditate. <laughs> so comments, reflections, we're in the home stretch now. Uh, uh, yes, Diane, I was hoping you'd speak. This has yeah. been wonderful. Thank you so much to everybody and the panel. Um, as you all were talking, I was thinking about Greta Thunberg, the Swedish, the young girl, she's 15, and has really started this global movement of young people. And so I want to echo what, Joan, what you said about this intergenerational and other people about giving up power and really letting young people and people of color lead. So I think, um, and that was in the R's as well, <laughs> it's to do with reconciliation and there was another one, relinquish, yeah. So, um, so I'm really inspired by, by her work and um, 350.org has an adult leaning in to um, be allies with the students and they're doing a huge demonstration in September. So um, I think it's Fridays for the Future and I know you were in Europe and you probably saw some of this, but um, it's really, it's quite thrilling. So I just wanted to put her name into the mix. Um, in terms of the power of the arts, um, I'm a real believer in the arts um, and the social imagination to bring the head and the heart together and to provide an experience of something that's unexpected and a surprise and can shift consciousness. And I just read a book that was so profound that I'm recommending called Go Went Gone. I don't know if anyone here has Go Went Gone. It's by Jennifer Esterbeck. It's, I didn't I get that for you? I think I did. But anyway, it's an amazing book and um, it's about the refugee crisis, and it is a bestseller. It's been translated. It's a beautiful translation um, about a professor who's retiring, and there's been a drowning in a lake, and he's obsessed. They haven't found the body. And then juxtaposed with that is his relationships that develop with a group of African refugees that are on a hunger strike in Alexander Plots by the subway. And the whole book unfolds around his heart opening to these refugees and the larger questions. And so it's this kind of both and. Like I think we have to be in the in the present moment. I um, and somebody who is aware of the importance of every breath because of my own health and being alive and being here. Um, and this big picture, and I'm going to struggle a little bit with that, and we'll want to follow up on how to bring these conversations into philanthropy, into board of trustees rooms, how do we hold the big picture, and that urgency of um, what we can do. So I'm talking too much, but thank you, and thank you, everybody. So. Pass it to someone else who'd like to speak. Michael, can I just make yes, one comment sure, Joan. to that? I, I hope this is uh, legitimate, but I just did with the Millennium Alliance for Humanity in the Biosphere, the mob, has a section on art and the role of art in particularly the environment, all the existential threats. And we invite contributions. And um, so I just. Um. I wanted to bring something else into the room, which I'd be curious to hear thoughts from the panel about. Um, something that Sarah, my partner, and I have talked a lot about recently is trauma. Um, she works with trauma resolution through psychedelic medicine. <laughs> and, um, you know, the, we, the culture is both traumatizing and traumatized. And what trauma does to humans is it puts us into this fight, flight, fear, freeze, often response. And the freeze response is the most dangerous in this case because we just don't know what to do. And so I, I, when I look at the culture at large, that's the response that I, I'm seeing when it comes to these issues is that people just get overwhelmed and are completely dissociative, unable to look at the problem because it's so scary. And because we have this trauma in us and in the culture. Um, so I'm curious if any of you have any thoughts or feelings about 
the, the trauma perspective. Go ahead, Nate. Uh, this gets back to your question maybe a little bit. So I teach uh, freshmen, sophomores, mostly freshmen. 30% of the students at my university, the University of Minnesota, uh, in the last 12 months have been on antidepressants, um, anti-anxiety, or OCD medicine. In the honors college where I teach, it's higher because they're more intelligent, they have empathic feelers out there, they're under more pressure from their parents. So not only am I a teacher, I'm also a psychologist, a coach, you know, a cheerleader, and so the role of education has changed. Now you asked about my students and their response, so they've self-selected a class called Reality 101, so most of them are searching for this story. And I find that there's like a bell curve and about a quarter of the students are like, oh my God, oh my God, no more, no more, no more. I'm thankful that class is done. Those are the students that had no idea about this stuff. They heard about climate change on CNN or had a high school class about it. That was like the limit. Another third of the students, this changed their life and they're a lifelong earth activist. They're in the flow because they were already freaked out coming into the class. And this framework, which you saw this morning, gave them a context for how everything fits together, and they're empowered. So I think it depends who, the type of personality we are. Who said that if you're that sort of person, you need to step up now? Right, so exactly. Those are the type of people that need to rise up and play a role. Not everyone is gonna be like that. And you hear this meta story that I told this morning. You don't all have to take on, tackle the giant crocodile that is facing us, but I think being aware of that superorganism framing will allow you to be more effective in the things that you're passionate about and have skills on. So we all need to play a role in that. As far as trauma, I've been told by psychologists, which I've imparted to my students, that the biggest thing, and I'm sure Joanna knows way more about this than I do, is if you share your experience with someone that understands, and even if you're just talking back and forth in a real human way, that suppresses cortisol, which is a stress hormone, it boosts helper T cells that help the immune system. Just the act of talking about something even with no resolution, is a huge benefit. Yet what do most students do? They're on their Facebook and Instagram and stuff like that that avoids any of this personal uh, interaction. Um, one final thought to Joan's comment, since I have the mic. We have this dinosaur story in our culture. They lived 70 million years ago. 25,000 years ago in this continent. We had seven species of cats, three species of elephants. We had beavers the size of Volkswagens. We had a Serengeti full of wildlife on this continent. No one talks about that. So where is the sense of sacred that's being baby stepped to death in uh, um, the, uh, what's it called? Not the availability cascade. Shifting baselines that we assume that today looks much like yesterday. So it's not a big deal, but maybe when our kids are our age, people are going to freak out when they see a squirrel because they're going to be so happy. Let's hope that's not the case. But we need to treat nature as if it's sacred. So somehow, something bordering on a religion that we really respect that, you know, there's heaven. Maybe this is heaven now, and we're destroying it. Thank you. Here, here. I want to call on Joan Evans, please. You had your hand up. Yeah, go ahead. Having seen a, a mastodome tooth um, last weekend at Green Gulch Farm, which is uh, right here in Marin County, just to say how shocking and fabulous it was to see it. Huge. Um, I wanted to just say what, what Angela said. Sean, could you speak up a little bit? The true human body is the entire universe. Um, the work that... Um, Alan and I have been able to participate in in the last two years has expanded to include refugees um, and it has really I think given us more uh, understanding of how true that is that um, the entire universe um, uh, is responding and, and pulsating um, in philanthropy we, we tend to get rather siloed and fixed on what the funding issues are but uh, in the last 
many years, the word interactivity and um, intersectionality has uh, come into being, but it, it, it's really kind of a faux word um, because people in philanthropy don't usually work together and they like to tell everybody else to do it um, and they themselves don't. Um, so one place we've seen something really remarkable happen and to tell all of you um, that I think this is an unusual model, but it's also a model that I, I believe is probably happening in more places, um, uh, uh, certainly than I know about. There's a group called helprefugees.org, uh, which is uh, a UK-based organization now working in, help me, Alan, uh, Greece, um, Syria, Turkey, uh, uh, Italy, mm. Uh, it used to work in Calais before the, those camps were closed. Uh, and there's a website that um, is a truly sort of um, at-the-moment at kind of website that does um, uh, fundraising there, but also what they've done is to um, create an, a, a diverse ecological system of both um, human and financial resources coming together and being able to be immediately responsive. It's a kind of um, wonder to people like us who see things that, you know, proposals that take months to happen and then, you know, money that needs to get released uh, over um, a, a huge um, amount of um, due diligence. This is uh, a group that is alive and on fire and, and working with people all over the world and their message, which they have uh, both printed on um, wonderful bags, but also made into pop-up shops, is Choose Love. Mm -hmm. And the Choose Love stores, there was one in Soho in New York this year, and there's one in London. They open for about six or eight weeks in, at Christmas time, and you can go in and um, uh, put your money down to buy a sleeping bag, to buy... Um, uh, um, bags of necessities, um, Kleenex, tampons, contraceptives, things that people need who are on the move, uh, boxes of toys. Um, you can um, really have a great spending spree in these places. And they've raised millions of dollars in this very short period of time, and then they go away, you know, in terms of the... There's, there's not a long maintenance, like, people don't need to... Um, Think about how are we going to sustain this, and the money keeps going back. It's that circular kind of. Um, it, it's an indigenous model, really, of um, the circular uh, economic uh, system that brings money back uh, all the time instead of just taking it. So I encourage you helprefugees.org. They are fantastic. Thank you. James Stark, we haven't heard from you, and you've done an amazing body of work on regenerative design, agriculture. Uh, you've been listening. You are still very active in the Commonweal Garden, teaching and have your center now up on Whidbey Island in Commonweal Northwest. Um, what are your reflections on what you've heard? Boy, that's, um, it's so rich. It's, it feels like today has been dessert. <laughs> um, I think, um, the session this afternoon when we started looking at what's the internal resilience um, work that we all have to do and um, was mentioned about finding your tribe um, and also bringing up about that we're not lone wolves even though lone wolves aren't lone wolves <laughs> but um, we are social beings and in the work that um, that I've experienced uh, with people over the last 14 years, and we've had about 500 people go through the journey of the chrysalis stage when there's a moment where there's, you want to step up into your gifts and make the, the difference. And, and what am I, like what, what do, what's my story and what do I want to bring forward that to do that transition and come out of the crystal stage and be in the crystal stage, it's, it's 
most important that you have around you a circle. And Michael, I just want to acknowledge the, the healing circle concept, and that's what we've done. And so every time we do a program, that circle, when we complete the directing of it, it continues to go forward as a circle and a buddy system. So when we're looking at often, uh, I, what I've found and we found in the work is that you as my buddy might see my gift. And what I want to compost, as Joanna was, was saying, what do we want to let go of? And what do we want to bring forward to have somebody who understands and we commit, this is where I want to go, support me. So I would really encourage us to find somebody um, in our circle who will be our companion to stepping up. And, and it's, I learned that from doing a program with a, a psychiatrist and we were participating in the same program and he introduced me to the point that he is a stand for my greatness. And greatness isn't like grandiose. Greatness is my gifts coming forward. So he doesn't see me or accept me in my smallness. And to have somebody who is a stake in our life for us being powerful and standing up in our communities and being the lights that we're going to need in our communities is really a critical element. And so I would really encourage us to find that person in our lives and, yeah. and uh, celebrate with them and, and be the support for them. Uh, Rob Ferraro, you've been an alum of the Cancer Help Program, a leader in that community for many years. You've thought about these issues. Um, love to hear your reflections on what you've heard today. Thank you, Michael. I've been thinking quite a bit about the Healing Circles Cancer Help Program principles and model of the power, the ordinary miracle of a Healing Circle where you give your generous attention and invite people to be deeply authentic and have specifically put aside any thought of fixing as being irrelevant to that ordinary magic. And I've been wondering whether or not, I mean, it's clearly both and, doing and being, it's clearly both and, and all the work we're doing in this room is clearly important. But I'm wondering if the wisdom of the Healing Circles model is that um, simply providing an opportunity for others to go deep into the feelings and reality that they have spent a great deal of time pushing away. I am seeing that there's more and more power in simply providing a generous listening ear and inviting people in a safe context to feel what they feel. And I'm thinking that that may be, in some ways, even more important than the specific tasks that we take on to save the world. And of course, that's exactly what Joanna Macy has been doing for decades. And you know, we honor that deeply. Kathleen Kramer, actually, you are leading the Healing Circles leadership training at Commonweal with uh, a community of us, some of whom are present. Um, uh, just your reflections on the day. Actually, what, what's in my head right now is a poem. Please. Speaking to what James said. It's, can it's, you speak up? Yes, I can. And it, and, it, and it addresses what Rob just talked about and James talked about, and, and I think what many of you talked about. It's, it's by Greg Kimura. It's called Cargo. You enter life laden with meaning, purpose, and gifts sent to be delivered to a hungry world. And as much as the world needs your gifts, you need to give them away. Everything depends on this. But the world forgets its needs, and you forget your mission. And the ancestral maps that used to guide you have become ancient scrawls on old parchment. The cargo weighs you heavy the longer it is held, 
and spoilage becomes a risk. (laughs) The ship sputters from port to port, and at each you ask, is this the way? But the way cannot be found without knowing the cargo. And the cargo cannot be known without recognizing there is a way. And it is simply this. You have gifts. The world needs your gifts. You must deliver them. The world may not know it is starving, but the hungry know. And they will find you when you discover your cargo and start to give it away. Thank you. Which brings us back to Joanna. Do you know any of your Rilke translations oh. by heart? Oh, yes. yes, I do. And could, you, one I would love. could you give us one? Yeah. Uh, this is the uh, last sonnet to Orpheus of the, uh, that uh, Rainer Maria Rilke brought out near the end of his life. And uh, my co-translator, Anita Barrows, and I were translating this when we, in 2003, when we were invading Iraq, in spite of the greatest demonstrations against it in this country and around the world. And so our hearts were very heavy. And working on this sonnet, um, I think I'll stand, uh, meant so much to us, and it has continued to mean so much to us, to me. Uh, so <clears throat> it goes like this. And he's speaking to you, and, and the first line is, Quiet friend, still a point, that comes from so far. You've been on the journey a long time. Quiet friend who's come so far. Feel how your breathing makes more space around you. Let this darkness be a bell tower and you the bell. And as you ring, what batters you becomes your strength. Swing back and forth into the changes. What's it like, this intensity of pain? Oh, if the drink is bitter, turn yourself to wine. In this uncontainable night, be the mystery at the crossroads of your senses, the meaning discovered there. And if the world has ceased to hear you, say to the silent earth, I flow, and to the rushing water speak, I am. Thank you. Thank you for So I want to begin to close a little early so that we have time to talk with each other. Uh, But first of all, I want to thank all of the presenters that have been with us today. Um, And uh, a special thanks to Nate Hagens from coming all the way to be with us. And um, uh, and a special thanks to Angela O for braving uh, a a power shutdown at LAX and making it up for the afternoon. Um, And and also to all of you, I I hope you share this, perhaps you do, perhaps you don't. But for me, this gathering has been significant and special. Uh, That somehow the universe brought us together today to hear each other and to deepen our understanding of what we are facing together. And um, I have to say, many people face what we're facing with a sense of fear or despair. Um, To be perfectly honest, I face life with joy. And I face what we're facing with joy. And that's just a truth for me. It's just my natural response. I feel that for whatever reason, I was born to be in this period of time. And that just as my work for the last 33 years has been in the Cancer Help Program, 206 retreats, week-long retreats of people living with cancer, uh, I feel that this is what I'm here to do. And I would suggest to you that many of us are here to do this together. That's what we've been given. 
and that our choice is whether to face it with cynicism or despair or something like that, or to face it with some version of hope or joy or curiosity about how uh, we will do this. But whatever happens, we bring our hearts and our love, whatever wisdom we've managed to gather, uh, a commitment to service. We're just here to serve as best we can. And whatever's going to come down, uh, we're here to serve in the midst of that. Whatever's going to happen, we're here to be as useful as we can and to bend the arc of history as we, much as we can toward justice and toward uh, the, the kind of world that we want to uh, live in. I loved what Steve Heilig said about how, you know, we wish we didn't have to go through what we have to go through, but here we are. And so, you know, I often think to myself, what do we tell our children or our grandchildren? You know, what is the story that we tell each other and them? And it seems to me that we need to find a way to tell a story about what is taking place that is truthful and that is full of hope. You know, let us not forget that for uh, several thousand years before this, people lived with a deep sense that uh, the end of the world as they knew it was going to come. You know, Maimonides said that you should not count the number of days till the Messiah comes. And so, there, in both in Christianity and in Judaism and in many other traditions, there was a sense, not, only, not unlike our current sense, that people were living at the edge of a transformative event of some kind. And that transformative event was filled with hope, actually. There was a sense that the righteous would, uh, you know, survive, and be called forward. And so it seems to me that we should be asking ourselves, how do we come to that place where in the face of what we regard as uh, an unalterable reality, which they also regarded as an unalterable reality, how can we speak to our children and to each other with courage and hope and a belief that humanity will survive this? Part of nature will survive this. The question is, who will we be as we survive this? How much of nature can we save? You know, the, the image in my mind is that we need to launch 100 million arcs around the world. We need to create arcs in which we take as much of life and as much of humanity as we can. And wherever we are, work to... Uh, carry ourselves through the floods and to, you know, rebuild a better world on the other side. That's the image I carry. So uh, I'm just grateful to each of you that took the time to be with us here today and uh, stay in touch. And if this work moves you, um, stay in touch with it. I want to just say again as we close that um, this work depends on you. And so if in some ways you're moved by it and wish to participate in it, let us know. We're just very grateful for that. So let's just end with a moment of silence. And then I want to ask Joanna Macy at the end of the silence to just give us a, a benediction, if you're willing to. So we'll just go into silence together. Joanna. Oh, great spirit, we give thanks for this day given to us for the opening of our heart minds, for the connections we're weaving, an ever greater sense of reality. We give thanks for reality 101 <laughs> and how it would keep on. Uh, feeding our curiosity and our will. Let us revel in the opportunities that open and feel held always, always by the source of life. Our living planet, by the ancestors and the 
future beings that are actually in our body now, in our DNA. With great thanks to Michael and to Commonweal with all its experience and to each other. Praise be. Amen. Thank you. Let me say when I ask for your support for this work, I include the Post Carbon Institute, the Millennial Alliance for Humanity and the Biosphere, um, the FAN Initiative, uh, and uh, all of the work that's being done. This is not about an individual organization, Nate's work, uh, all the work that's being done. We need to raise up this work as a whole, and we need to be generous with each other about raising the community. So um, find what speaks to your heart and find a way to connect with it. Thank you all so much for being here. Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah.